Welcome to the Big Kids Book Club. A podcast about all things fictional, from middle grade to young adult. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey, 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 welcome back to the podcast. You are listening to the Big Kids Book Club podcast. My name is Marcus, I'm your host. And joining me in the clubhouse today, we have Dan Walker, author of the Sky Thieves and the Light Hunter series. Welcome to the show, Dan. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's good to see you. Oh, no, thank you. Really, really grateful for having you on the show. And uh, with all of our, our authors who join us, we'd like to get to know them a little bit better. So great place to start off with is sort of looking back into your writing journey. So how you started writing and got to where you are at the moment. Oh man, most authors at this point would tell you a little story about how they were writing when they were five years old with little books that they've made and stuff like that. I wasn't really like that. I've got one really strong memory of writing a story as homework with my dad. And I loved it at the time. It was something about these five gold rings and this kind of fantasy tale. I realise now he was just ripping off Lord of the Rings. But um, he came up with most of the ideas, just to explain. But no, I didn't, I didn't start writing properly until I was actually quite a lot older. I read a lot of books, a hell of a lot of books when I was younger. But I never had this idea of writing stories uh, until I hit about... Well, I went to university and studied English. And that was the point at which I thought I could... I'd quite like to have a go at writing stories myself and then I started off by writing a short story and I liked that short story so I decided to turn that into a book um, and they, these were books for adults at the time yeah. um, and they never got them published in the end but it sort of taught me the, how to write and yeah. uh, editing and going through things and planning stories and characters and all that stuff and then over the last this was like 15 years ago the last 15 years I've got better and improved and oh, you know course. read read upon stuff so yeah that that's that's basically been the start point for me it was a lot older than a lot of authors i think yeah interesting you mentioned there that you were you were writing um sort of for adults and sort of coming out of university sort of writing for adults when was the sort of transition then into the sort of like more sort of like kids fi uh, fiction and was it sort of was sort of sky thieves the first sort of dipping your toes into, into yeah into it? Yeah, pretty much. I It was about five years after I'd been writing some adult books. So I'd, I've been trying to get an agent with those adult books and I got really close a couple of times yeah. and I needed a new book to write. And I just thought, I just had, I'd, I'd read a couple of books. There was Philip Pullman's, um, his Dark Materials trilogy, yes. an amazing little series. Yes. Um, and, but also Philip Reeves' Mortal Engines. Mortal Engines, yes. Yeah, and I'd read that book and I, 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 I remember thinking to myself, this is my kind of thing, I like this. I think I could come up with ideas fairly similar to this. So I, I then, I remember I got a piece of paper, an A4 piece of line paper, and I wrote down a bullet point of about 12, 15 bit cool things that I thought could happen in a children's story. Obviously, revolving around the Sky Thieves airship, so it's like a meteor near misses with a, a meteor shower and volcanoes and skyship chases and stuff like that. And I knew a little bit about story structuring at that point, not as much as I do now. Looking back, I barely know anything, but I knew a little bit enough to string together a story. So I kind of put those two things together the, the bullet points and the, the structure, and then came up with this, this Sky Thieves. And I wrote a bit of it, and then I left it, and then I went back to it and finished it. And, it's, what, it's like everything. It took me a few years in the end to get there. But, um, oh, yeah. But, yeah, I was, I, once, I, once I started writing kids' books, I realised that's the place for me. I enjoy the narrative of it much more. I like the, the silliness, the funny jokes. Um, yeah, I like kids' books a lot now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump around too much, I think. No, yeah. And so was it quite quick then, the sort of transition to finishing off, I guess, the first sort of iteration of Sky Thieves? And was, um, was it another... Because a lot of authors say it's quite a slog. You finish writing and then you've got another uphill battle to find an agent for maybe a couple yeah, of years. Or yeah. did you find a quite quick movement once you had Sky Thieves finished? To be honest, I sat on it for quite a while and I was, I was looking at other ideas and I edited it loads. Like, I, I don't, fortunately, I'm quite lucky now because I've been writing a while. You, your first draft tends to improve a little bit and then your second draft's a bit better. But I think the original Sky Thieves must have gone through about, I'm not exaggerating, 13, 14, 15 oh. week draftings. But I didn't mind it because you're learning the, the craft, you're yeah. learning the work, you're learning how to be a writer. 
And so I did that and then eventually I sent it out and I had again, I had some interest and I nearly got an agent hook into it, which for me at the time was a big thing because I was really trying to get an agent and I'd yeah. sent off quite a few manuscripts and struggled a bit. But he didn't go for it in the end. We went backwards and forwards with a bit a few changes to the book and he was like, he sent me this email saying, I, was, I just was so close, but unfortunately not quite right and so i left that book for a bit for another year or two and it's only i always say this when i'm talking to kids in school it was only about uh, a couple of years later when i'd got a bit of time on my hands and i went back to the book and i read the beginning of it and like you do when you've got fresh eyes on something you notice how it could be improved and i could tell that the beginning was a little bit slow and you know there were a couple of characters that could merge and cut so i did that little bit of work and sent it off and that's when things went good I had one agent offer to represent me and then about a day later I had another one and a week later about another one. So I think at that point I'd turned the book into something pretty cool and had a bit of a choice to make. And so I ended up going with the one that, you know, impressed me the most and, and they've become my agent. But yeah, it was like a lot of authors, it was quite a long journey, I think, to get there, yeah. Yeah, but it's obviously worth it. Um, Sky Thieves uh, then developed a, a sequel. We got to see uh, Sawyer and the, the Dragonfly come back for Desert Thieves. Yeah. And so was, um, was it always in your mind that Sky Thieves was to have a sequel or was it just sort of like natural that you're like, I've got another idea for these guys? Yeah, I think it was more, more the second one, to be honest. Because like I said, I hadn't planned two, three, four, five books or anything when I first planned Sky Thieves. But as soon as I finished that one, I started to have ideas of, obviously Sky Thieves is a book about being up in the sky, flying through the sky on ships. You can tell from the front cover. And I love the idea of, like a lot of good books, it's that fish out of water into a new world. So I wanted to take those Sky Thieves down to the ground. Um, and there'd been a city that I described in the first book called Dalmacia. And it's this beautiful kind of steampunky style city. And I just wanted to take my characters to that city. And so that's what I did. Yeah, I came up with a way to bring them down to the ground in, in, in what would a big airship crash. And then they, they travel across the ground, meet a couple of new characters that are quite cool. And yeah, I like that book, the, the second one. I've got a soft spot for that one. I, I really enjoyed this speech, yeah. So from, uh, from the two books there, it was then you've moved on to something a little bit new. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the most recent one, which launched actually this year, wasn't it? It was released yeah, in 2020. January. We had yeah. uh, Light Hunters and we got introduced to Lux and uh, Squad Juno. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I li again, I, I like that book. That's a, that was a, a sort of a work of passion for me. I wanted to write, with that one, I, I play a lot of computer games and I, I really like computer games and the grammar of computer games and the way they're structured and the mechanics. And I think a lot of kids like that as well. And I've seen a lot of publishers down the years bring out books aiming for that computer game market, but they're often just a man in an army costume with a gun on the front and they're missing what it is that kids like about games. So I wanted to do something that was a bit more around the class system. You know, games have classes, you got healers, tanks, DPS and everything. And I wanted to do something like that. And then mixed with this kind of magic-y stuff and these huge big monsters, like sort of forces of nature, almost like hurricanes or something. And so I kind of mixed all that together and then you've got these light hunters, you've got this magical power. Oh, and the other thing I really wanted to do is I wanted to do a main character that was a healer. So they, they'd got um, magical powers, but they weren't, they weren't attacking things. They weren't trying to break things down. Although that does happen in the book. Um, I wanted them to be their main thing to be healing people, looking after people. Um, so anyway, I put all that together and that became Light Hunters uh, with, with a cool little story. So yeah, yeah, that's good. And that's published by Uclan, who's done a brilliant, brilliant job with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I won't say touch on Uclan in a bit, but actually, I think I think you'd be looking at my notes because I was going to ask if there's any <laughs> computer game. It was the way. Oh yeah, the, definitely. You know, uh, the archer and you know, the healer, yeah. the tech, and yeah, it yeah, definitely yeah. does have that feel of that sort of like I was going to say D and D sort of party where you mm. have the different yeah. Rooms together. Yeah. yeah. Touching on that, it was really nice to see that Lux had this um, ability to heal and that's what sort of really made him stand out, you know, the fact that he develops as well throughout the book and he sort of grows into his skill, which is really mm. nice to see, especially as a sort of young character, because of course middle grade is great at finding that area of developing a, a sense of oneself uh, and the relationship with a family. So what you did there, did you always have the idea of, of him being so close to his granddad? Because you don't see many grandparents in yeah. books so was yeah. that always a big focus for you the family side yeah I, it was to a degree it's not not through anything through my family it was more 
often things in books or certainly in my books uh, come about because of structural reasons so let's say we, we've got the scenario in the book where these monsters are attacking town and you want Lux to have some reason to dislike that personally not just you know yeah. theoretically so you think parents he's lost his parents these monsters and his sister which then obviously necessitates that he needs to live with somebody else and i had i had this idea of the beating heart of the story being Lux wanting to save his grandpa which is why his grandpa is a little bit ill at the start and once i put that in it was it, yeah that was that became the center the, the personal center of the story kind of the internal center of the story but yeah, yeah, I think it's partly structural, partly, you know, yeah, I wanted it to have that emotional angle as well. Yeah, no, I loved it because it, it sort of subverted the trope because you do get quite a lot of them where, bless them, the amount of orphans in middle grade can be oh, quite, yeah. oh, they're another yeah. set of orphans. But actually the yeah. fact that you did have such a, like the grandfather figure, I was like, okay, I like this. Uh, cool. Quite, quite cool. close to my grandparents. So it was, it was a real nice thing to see that we had a grandparent in a, in a story. It's funny you mentioned the parents, the orphan thing, actually, because that is a real sticking point, I think, with children's books. It's, it's almost the first thing your brain goes to when you're trying to think of the structure of your, your child's life at the start, because you've got to take them out of that world. And it's hard to do sometimes, because if they have parents, uh, those parents would just go, no, you're not going with a strange man into the new world. Stay here. And <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, I think that's why a lot of, of authors do fall back on the orphans thing and i've got i've got no beef with that i've got it myself yeah. but um but i'm constantly trying to think of ways to change that or do something slightly different which is one of the reasons going back to philip pullman one of the reasons i really like uh northern lights is that angle that he's oh, got yeah. with um with lord asriel at the start you know he is in her life but he's not in her life her parents they are the antagonists in the story and certainly in the first one so she's kind of like this orphan who's living with, who's living with the the church but she's kind of not and they come into a life and out of life i thought i thought he twisted that really really well uh, in that book so i always try and think of something yeah yeah absolutely like i said not shooting anyone who's listened to oh, my yeah, favorite definitely. middle grade's got orphans not shooting orphans just saying it was a nice little touch that it was slightly different Thanks. um but what also was different was, of course, you mentioned earlier that Light Hunters was published um, by a different uh, publishing house, which was UCLan, which is kind of unique because they're attached to a university, aren't they? University yeah. of Central Lancashire. Yeah, I love, I love those guys. They're sort of an up-and-coming outfit, really. They're, they're quite small, run by quite a small group of people, but they've got this really clever little system where they have an MA in publishing up there, um, and they, it, they use the publishing house that they've got now, the children's publisher arm, to allow those students to get involved, take part in the actual, the, the, the creating of an actual real book that goes out on the shelf. But they've also, they've just got some great people there. They've got a great editor, they've got great cover designers, really clever, thoughtful people who are putting out some really, really nice books. I've just finished uh, Monsters in the Mirror by AJ Harley, which is another book they put out a couple of years ago. And that was a fantastic story, fantastic kid story. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy there, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we might be looking at doing a, a Light Hunters 2. So Ooh. that'd be good as well. Yeah, I've got, I've got the idea, I just haven't written it yet, but <laughs> it's, it's in the back of the mind. Pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool. But yeah, no, I, I, I met them, um, I met some of them last year, I went to Yauk, uh, the London YA Festival, and actually, yeah, they had a stall there, and I got chatting to them. So it seemed really interesting, like you say, the way they've integrated education into the publishing process. But another cool thing that you were able to do with this new publisher was you were actually able to narrate the audiobook for Light Hunters. So writer and narrator, how was that yeah. experience? This, I, I've said, I said to my wife when we were first, you know, I think this is the most exciting thing that's happened so far in my author career. A lot of authors say that it's getting the book on the shelf or going into Waterstones or whatever. I don't know why, I just really, really, really enjoy narrated stories. And I listen to a lot of audiobooks myself, so it was really, really cool to um, to do it and, and to do the voices. So we got a um, they, we got a really cool mic. It was during the pandemic, so we couldn't do it in a recording studio like you would normally do. So we did it in my home. And to get the sound right, I actually did it in this room. And you have to be careful with the noise in rooms yeah. when you do audiobooks with the reverb. So we had to kind of, I was under my wife's standing desk, surrounded by duvets and blankets <laughs> in this pitch black environment with a mic like yours in front yep. of me. Uh, the book on my phone and sort of reading it out but it was dick of fun uh, the one thing i found really hard was doing voices you don't realize oh, yeah. that's a real skill and when an actor reads a book 
a, a, an audio book aloud. They're often very good. Like there's a there's a good version of um, La Belle Sauvage, the the first in the new trilogy from Philip Pullman. It's read by I think it's Michael Sheen. I always get the name wrong. Michael Sheen, Martin Sheen, one of the two. Uh, the one the the Welsh guy, the Welsh the actor, yeah. Tony Blair. Yes. Yeah. Um, and his ability to do voices, I'm so jealous of it. So we would often be recorded by audiobook, and I would try a voice and it would sound terrible, then I'd try another voice and it would sound terrible, and eventually we hit on one which was semi-okay. Um, but yeah, well, I, I'd love to do more audiobooks, and, I, and hopefully you can all allow that as well. Yeah, it's because you do hear some people who are sort of starting out and doing sort of, I, I even considered it for my thing, it's like, you know, I, I'm working in quite a small sort of side bedroom, sort of spare bedroom, mm -hmm as far as mine because it, it gives less reverb but i've heard mm. people like in their closets and stuff like that when they're recording yeah. so yeah it's it's quite fun but i think that was quite a unique thing to do i mean you do hear some of them and talking about voices was actually another point i wanted to ask do you then have because obviously the characters you see them in your mind when you're writing them people always talk about voice in books but of course you've now voiced the voices as it were did you yeah. already have like maybe accents or voices or narrative style in play or did was that something you had to quickly learn as you were recording a bit of both i i had a feel for the character kind of i knew i knew roughly what i wanted them to be without having a specific accent or you know vocal tone or anything but i knew let's say artello nova who's like the the mentor character in the story he um you know he has to have that dark gravelly voice you know and then there's a there's a kind of a rugged light hunting me later on he's gonna have that kind of you know so i think you get an idea but you play around with the voices until you find the right one yeah it's good fun but my wife had to listen to some rubbish before we got to, <laughs> to the right ones oh fantastic well at least like you've had that experience like i said a lot of people i think it's just the publisher will go well they'll find an actor and stuff but you've actually been able to keep that as sort of like a creative outlet Definitely. so uh, yeah i feel really lucky you kind of really kind to let me do that because they could have got somebody else but it's nice to be able to read your own story definitely and, and one thing i would say actually as well it's nice reading your own story because you know exactly the tone and the delivery you're oh, intending to yeah. put it on the page. Because it is, we write the stories down, but they're very much a, a lyrical thing. They kind of have a rhythm to them. Mm. So it's lovely being able to read that story exactly as you intended for people, you know, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. so it's not uh, misconstrued in any way. You're yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Well, um, you have already hinted on my next question by um, teasing what you're working on at the moment. But uh, is it very much sort of like, is there like a, a second book option on the deal for Light Hunters 2 or is there possibly a second or third in the process? We're, we're talking about it in a minute. So I think, I think, I think we're getting there. Yeah, I think we're getting there. But I've got, I've got the plan. I sort of did that six months ago, a year or so ago. Oh, I'm pretty much ready. It, need, it needs a bit of work again because whenever you do a plan, you go back yeah. to it and then you need to look at it again. But um, yeah, I think I'm ready to do it. I'm actually working on something else in a minute. I've, I've been working on, I've been reading a lot of fairy tales. So I, I wanted to uh -huh. do something that was very much set in that kind of fairy tale fantasy world. So I planned something a little while ago and I started writing probably the first six or seven chapters of that. That's my kind of daily, daily thing I'm writing at the minute. And that normally takes me about six, seven months, and then I'll rework yeah. it and rework it and rework it and keep on reworking it. So I'm happy. Oh, the editing process, yeah. Yeah. I'm down from 15 to probably eight or nine drafts now. So I'm getting better, but it still takes me time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A writing process, anyone who's even tried it, you, you think, it's, oh, I write a book. It's so much more. There's so much, so more. much more. But having said that, I love that bit because the, the writing bit I find horrible and stressful and, and it creates horrible anxiety. Every morning when I wake up to write, I have this weird feeling of like nothing's going to come nothing nothing's going to come in my brain there's going to be nothing to to write on my computer or if it is it's going to be absolutely terrible and i'll just have to spin it but the editing process oh, that's, that's wonderful you've got it done for you so all you're doing is improving something that's already there that's i, I really like that side oh, that's um, it's quite interesting because you do get some some people like they love to i know i like to write i hate, hate editing wow um, you're the opposite then. Yeah. i'm the opposite i, I yeah. write something i'm very passionate and then i'm like right well let's fix this and it's <laughs> oh dear yeah. no that's that's brilliant to see how you have obviously a slightly different way of like constructing your your words and your worlds so that's quite interesting to see and exciting mm. to hear fairy tales is it um 
is it a sort of classic retelling or is it sort of dark? Can no, not at all. It's more the it's more the world. It's Ooh. not it's not really a, a fairy tale as such. It's more I just read a lot of fairy tales. I love the there's so many common threads in fairy tales. I've read yeah. sort of all sorts of books from Grimm to Hans Christian Andersen to Japanese fairy tales, and there's, there's there's common threads that run through them all. And so I wanted to write a story in that world. Yeah. So it's, I, I've done a lot of steampunky, magical, gamey world yeah. so far. You've got your Tolkien's, your Harry Potter's, and I wanted something that was a little more, almost in the middle of those oh, two. Okay. Your castles and knights and, um, you know, trees and apples and all, all those kind of things you think of from, from fairy tales. You know, little cottages in the woods, stuff like that, animals, th things like that, those ideas. So that's what I've been working on. Okay, so we've got quite a few things to look forward to coming out. So exciting times. Fingers crossed, yeah. Yeah, well, that I do like to hear. Very much enjoyed Sky Thieves Red all last year, the year before. I think oh, 2018 cool. it came out, wasn't it? 2018? Sky Thieves, uh, 2017. 2017, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was but fun, yeah. just recently finished my copy of Light Hunters, read it on a holiday. That was good fun. I really like the, the way you pace them. They're always very pacey, nice, short, breathy. And it almost feels like you say computer game, it feels that action really quick. Yeah. So uh, fingers crossed, you know, we get some more action packed adventures. Um, there's a reason I do that actually. There's one of my favorite authors when I was younger was a guy called Kurt Vonnegut. And oh. he used to do really short chapters. And I found myself reading them and I would I'd turn a page and the end of the chapter was there. But what it, what it made me do is it made me go, well, I might as well just read one chapter. <laughs> yeah. pages. And then you're like, Okay, I'll go with one more because there's only two. So it keeps you reading, and I, I quite like it. Gives you a nice getting off point if you've got to go and do yep. something, but it keeps keeps you reading. And I thought I'd do that for my books as well. And a lot of the kids that I've spoken to have said they really like that side of it that it that, that they're not too long, so they can kind of just jump through them nice and quickly. Oh yeah, I love the idea, and I have I definitely did it. It's like well, the next one's only two or three pages long. I might yeah, as well read the next one just yeah, find out exactly. what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tease you to finish. So yeah, I finished yeah. it about two days. It was awesome. really good. But I really enjoyed uh, your writing. I'm excited to find out some uh, more, especially Light Hunters 2. Really excited for that because I want to see more of Lux and Squad Juno. But unfortunately, we're going to have to end today's session there. But before we go, we've got an exciting little competition to have. We are going to give one of you guys who is listening the chance to win Light Hunters. We're giving away a signed copy, signed by Dan himself, to one lucky listener. Now, what we have to do is you have to go onto Twitter, find us at Big Kids Book Club, or one word, find our Twitter page, like us, follow us, and all you want to do is send us a tweet with the hashtag Squad Juno Comp, all one word. I'll put all the uh, descriptions and the T's and C's in the actual podcast, you know, the, the heading itself. So you'll have all the, the T's and C's there, but it would just be one quick tweet to us at Big Kids Book Club, hashtag Squad Juno Comp, and in there we want to know what is your favorite monster? Because, of course, you use Cerberus for your sort of big baddie in Light Hunters, but you guys yeah. might have one. You've mentioned Japanese folk tales and folk tales from all around the world. Some great monsters to pick from. So, we want to hear your favorites. But that is what we do. We'll uh, shout out, and one lucky winner will receive that. Dan, you'll uh, sign in that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, there you go. Um, Dan, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you for joining us in the clubhouse today. Thank you for having me. Cheers, Bob. No, absolutely. And we look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully, in the future. Um, cool. But that, unfortunately, is the end of today's episode. You can always catch us again soon, so keep an eye out for us. We're on Spotify, iTunes, and all other good podcasting host sites, so check us out there. But until next time, keep on reading. Mm -hmm.